Welcome to Failed Utopia, the podcast about utopian ideas and paradise lost. We look at utopian concepts of the past, present, and future, as well as utopian communities and cults, which promise the world to eager followers, but inevitably fail when it all starts to unravel. Hello, failed utopians. I have a great story for you coming up about what was once the largest hippie commune in U.S. history, and it still exists today, albeit in a somewhat different form. But first, I do have a quick addendum to the last episode about Oroville. Shortly after that episode came out, I went to my local pharmacy to pick up a prescription And there on my box of medication, I see the manufacturer label says Aurobindo. And I'm like, wait, what? Like our favorite Indian guru, Sri Aurobindo? What does this mean? And I see it's manufactured in India, which of course is not surprising because we all know a lot of medication, especially generics, are made in India. But it just seemed like the name couldn't be a coincidence. So I looked into it a little. Turns out Orobindo is actually a global pharma giant. They are a big player, so maybe some of you listening have heard of the company before. I hadn't, and I learned that the company was founded in the late 1980s in, any guesses? Yeah, in Pondicherry, which you might remember from the episode is where Sri Orobindo's yoga ashram was, and of course, not far from Oroville. The founder is still running the company today, but apparently he's a pretty private billionaire and seems to avoid publicity and the media, so I guess people don't know a whole lot about him, which leaves me to speculate whether he was a follower or admirer of Sri Aurobindo or even went to the ashram, maybe? Who knows? But I thought this possible connection was pretty interesting. And it just popped into my life as a weird little coincidence, the way these things often do. I did reach out to the company with my burning question, and no one got back to me, or at least not yet. If I ever hear anything back, I'll let you guys know. But for now, that's all I've got. So let's move on to something, well, actually something not entirely different. The community I'm about to tell you about actually has some philosophical and historical threads pretty similar to Oroville. The farm is an intentional community on 1,750 acres near Somerton in south-central Tennessee. I will spare you all my rendition of Tennessee whiskey here. In 1971, a dreamer named Stephen Gaskin led 300 of his fellow hippies on a cross-country road trip from San Francisco in a caravan of 50 buses, which they outfitted to live in. Wow, that must have been fun. But they weren't just driving around scaring all the squares with their long, frizzy hair and goofy pants. They were looking for a piece of land to settle and launch a commune based on sustainability, a simple, back-to-the-earth agrarian lifestyle, and shared resources. Many of these seekers had converged in San Francisco during the 1967 Summer of Love, the height of hippie fever, and they set out with the hippie ethos very much in mind. Their spiritual leader, Stephen Gaskin, was an English professor teaching writing at San Francisco State, but found himself unsatisfied with the administration's stale approach to coursework and departed the university that he loved, but referred to as a pain in the butt. When his contract with the university was not renewed, he started teaching a night class where he talked about spirituality, pacifism, world events and politics, philosophy, and a bunch of hippie stuff. It grew and grew until this night class consisted of hundreds of students, possibly up to a thousand. 
and it was from this group of Monday night class devotees that the caravan of hippies sprang. They traveled from state to state, getting high, picking up strays along the way, with Stephen Gaskin giving talks about a peaceful revolution in the towns they passed through. The group grew, people paired off, a few babies were born on the buses, and about a year later, they pooled their resources and decided to buy some land and settle down in Tennessee. I'm not sure the particular reason for Tennessee. They thought it was a nice place with nice people, although that describes a whole lot of places. And the hippie caravan didn't exactly get a warm welcome when they arrived. They had a little trouble finding anyone willing to sell them land. It seems the good people of Tennessee weren't exactly keen on having hundreds of hippies moving in. But they finally caught a break when a sympathetic guy offered to let them stay on a piece of land in Lewis County where there was plenty of room for all their buses. The residents of nearby Somerton weren't exactly thrilled with their new neighbors, but eventually they started to come around, and over time, the commune was able to purchase some land of their own. To his credit, Gaskin realized early on that if they wanted to make their fledgling community last, they'd need to traverse a steep learning curve. They didn't exactly have the farming and building experience they needed to make a go of it. So Gaskin invoked the Buddhist concept of right livelihood and told his troop of hippies to get to work, which they did. They learned to grow gardens and a couple of cash crops like soy and sorghum to start bringing some income to the community. Work became the physical manifestation of their spiritual practice as preached by Gaskin. And they worked hard. The commune needed sewage management, more crops, places to live, clean water, a school, a cemetery, and all the other basic infrastructure to support hundreds of men, women, and children in a remote area. Early on, the commune ran afoul of the law when some locals noticed naked commune members serenading a large marijuana patch with flutes and alerted the police. We told you about a traveling commune of more than 200 people who spent several weeks looking for a house in place to live. They settled for a place near Nashville, but it didn't quite work out, as Del Vaughn reports. They say the group is held together by a kind of religion. They traveled more than 50,000 miles around the country looking for their own utopia, a farm, land to live on, and grow organic crops. But they found the hard way authorities don't consider some crops to fall into the organic vegetable category. <laughs> Stephen Gaskin took the fall, was arrested, and spent a year behind bars. Nonetheless, word continued to get around about the hippie utopia in Tennessee, and people kept coming. By the time the commune reached its peak around 1980, almost a decade after its founding, it had 1,500 residents. They also offered their community as a place for pregnant women who didn't want a child but also didn't want an abortion to come and have their babies in a safe place where they could give up their child at the commune but retain the option to have their child back if they later changed their minds. And about 300 women did avail themselves of this opportunity and had their babies in the commune, though almost all of them did end up keeping their babies instead of relinquishing them. By about 1983, the farm essentially had too many people and too few resources to continue as it had been, holding all things in community as a true commune. They were subsisting on about $1 per person per day up until that point, and the influx of new residents was pushing the community to its breaking point. The quality of life was unimpressive, and kids went hungry, their organic crops couldn't quite feed all the mouths. The farm was $400,000 in debt, had no insurance, and substantial medical bills, leading a hospital to put a lien on their property. The farm decided they needed to pivot to avoid financial catastrophe and became more of a co-op. No more did everything belong to everyone. Individual families were now responsible for their own income, their own house, 
and paid dues to the community. Residents call this troubled time the changeover. In the tumult that ensued, the group's leader, Stephen Gaskin, was asked to step down. And in perhaps the best proof we have that this was never a cult, he did. And he continued to live at the farm he loved for the rest of his life. The changeover was a huge upheaval and remains controversial today, with former residents seemingly bitterly divided over what the change meant and how bad it really was. Certainly, many people went away brokenhearted, their dreams of hippie utopia shattered. Unfortunately for many, their time spent in the commune hadn't necessarily equipped them with the skills and resume for life elsewhere, and whatever resources they'd had were handed over to the commune when they arrived. For some people, this more or less meant starting over from scratch after leaving the farm, disillusioned and broke. But others stayed, and from amid the ashes of the conflict and controversy of the 80s, a group more focused on just living an alternative, healthy, rural lifestyle emerged. They focused on practical matters, building up 20 businesses to bring in income and ultimately survived as a community, albeit with much diminished numbers. Today, about 200 people still live at the farm and present their community as an eco-village. They promote and experiment with sustainable building practices and observe a vegan lifestyle. They focus on education and outreach and their charitable endeavors and host visitors. Over its 50 years, the farm has established several nonprofit organizations. It seems the community actually does have a legitimate commitment to making the world a better place, and they put their money where their mouths are in this regard. Or maybe not their money, but their volunteer hours. The farm is also known for its midwifery program, in which the quote, sacrament of birth is considered as an inherent right of all women, newborns, and families. They offer basic and advanced midwifery training workshops. The community's practical and spiritual leader, Stephen Gaskin, died in 2014 at the farm. The farm is still a spiritual community, but doesn't follow any specific doctrine. According to an entry on the Foundation for Intentional Community website, at the farm, there is general agreement that all world religions share essential truths that are the moral guideposts for sanity and happiness. So it sounds like they're still going with a basically trans-religious approach. The community is managed by an elected board of directors and a variety of committees run by volunteers. It actually sounds pretty idyllic if you enjoy a quiet rural lifestyle. Now, if you like the sound of this place, according to the farm's website, here is how to visit or move in. The farm is open to visitors every day. You can just stop by or call ahead to have a staff member meet you. You can sign up for a guided tour, stay in their campground, or take part in a farm experience weekend where you can meet people, take tours, do workshops on stuff like alternative education and midwifery, and all sorts of other fun stuff. Now, if you want to stay longer or, you know, forever, there's quite a bit to it, and the website details a years-long process of elevating yourself from visitor to extended visitor to resident to provisional member to full member (laughs) through various applications, forms, living arrangements, and paying them money. So there you go. As I wandered the Google looking for interesting leads, I ran across another alternate website for the farm. So there's thefarmcommunity.com and then there's thefarm.org. This definitely smacks of the type of place where nobody's really in charge of things. In fact, in a disclaimer at the bottom, it says, This site, like all websites for the farm community, is unofficial, unauthorized, and entirely a volunteer effort that has not been approved by the community. (laughs) So yeah, this other or perhaps older version of the website has some wacky stuff. It's way less professional and a lot more fun, and has navigation headings like who we 
hippiness, Huda Man, and my personal favorite, Red Pill, which led me not to a QAnon slash New Right conspiracy page as I feared, but to a form with a background of the green code from The Matrix. Promising, I am a big fan of The Matrix. The text on this page says, Welcome to a developing space. Beyond normal space, beyond time. Access a virtual simulation that goes farther down the rabbit hole. This got me pretty fired up, but then above the form it says, If you are a VR slash AR creator and would like to accept this challenge, please apply here. So I guess they're looking for someone to take on this as yet imaginary project. Maybe one of you, dear listeners, would be interested in this. I have a feeling it probably doesn't pay too well. Maybe they'll give you a year supply of millet or something. <laughs> but even the form itself is a little weird. It's got fields for your name and contact info, but then it has a rate us thing where you can click on the stars to give a rating. <laughs> like, what? Why am I giving you guys a star rating to apply for an unpaid internship? <laughs> Probably this form is just like a widget they grabbed the code for online and didn't customize it. That would be my guess. But then you can click on a button that says engage to submit the form. <laughs> or you can click a button that says take the blue pill to go back to the main website. So it's like a really shitty version of the Matrix 4 trailer. This really seems to me like maybe one person or a few people interested in whatever the hell this is put this together. I doubt this is like a community-wide initiative or anything. I would like to know what the actual fuck this is all about, but I was running out of time to work on this episode, so I did not follow that particular rabbit hole. But if I get some free time, I might try to reach someone through this form just to see what happens and if somebody actually answers. So yeah, if anything happens, I will, of course, update you guys. So in conclusion, let's ask ourselves the perennial question, hippie utopia or dystopia? Sometimes I hear people saying like, What happened to all the hippies? Why did all the boomers end up creating the late-stage capitalist hellscape we're living in? Weren't they all hippies? Well, no. I think I ranted about this in one of my earlier episodes, Naked in the Woods. But long story short, not very many people were into the hippie thing. Like, less than 0.2% of people in the late 60s actually identified with the hippie movement. So it's really no mystery why the hippie generation never ushered in world peace. Close to 100% of them never got into the hippie stuff in the first place. And it's just a misconception that there even was a hippie generation. It was a tiny, tiny fraction of society that happened to have a very outsized cultural impact and legacy that we still love to talk about today. But maybe that gives a little perspective on why the farm and other communes of its ilk don't seem to have mass appeal. I guess most people just aren't attracted to the lifestyle then or now. I always laugh a little when these types of places describe themselves as model communities because they never seem to catch on. Never or at least not so far. Maybe at some point I'll be coming to you with an episode about the model community that changed the world, but don't hold your breath. For the people living at the farm, it may be a little piece of paradise, but if the population continues to dwindle, what are their prospects for the future? If you want to hear a bunch more about hippies and another 1970s hippie commune, check out episode 7 of Failed Utopia, Naked in the Woods. Till next time. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to help other people find it. Tell your friends about it. And if you want to support the pod directly and help keep new episodes coming, you can donate to the show through the link at the bottom of the show notes. 
Connect and stay in the loop on the website failedutopia.com or the Facebook page at Failed Utopia Pod. Failed Utopia episodes are written and produced by me, Anna Roberts. The burning palm tree painting featured on the cover is by artist Perry Vasquez. My intro music is by Elliot Middleton. See you next time.